Hello, everyone. Good afternoon again. How many of you were in the lecture last week or yeah, last week? All of you? Most of you? Okay. So um, we won't do an encore. I mean, it won't be a repeat uh, what we did. The, the idea last week was to set the stage for the treatment, clinical aspect of management of heart failure. Now, I, th th I changed the talk yesterday. I originally wanted to do the clinical assessment, physical exam, um, um, you know, diagnostic tests, and what have you, but I thought it probably make more sense to early on in the year to just go ahead and get down to business. I mean, you know, just tell you what the treatments, the, the guidelines want us to, want us to, to give. And I have to say I've given a lot of heart failure talks over the past eight, nine years. And I've never done this, which is borrow slides that I've not put together. And not one of these slides <laughs> is my slide. So I, this is a big disclaimer. And this is the first time that I've ever done that. You know, and I've given too many talks about heart failure. And, and, I, and the reason I'm trying this, and, and you're my guinea pigs, so <laughs> bear with me. I'm trying this because I think it makes more sense to because there's too many things that I can talk about when it, when it comes to heart failure management. And, and I think the, the most important thing for us clinicians, take home messages, I think, is to, what is the bottom line? What do we need to do? You know, you know how the best practice people harass you all the time about ACE inhibitors and beta blockers? And, so we might as well just learn it ourselves and know what the, what the rationale behind um, doing this. Now, this slide set, is from the Heart Failure Society of America. So you can access this online, and there are many um, sections. I took the one uh, on reduced ejection fraction, um, because that's the majority of the patients that you see here in the hospital. And um, unlike the American College of Cardiology guidelines, where they give you background behind their recommendations, i.e., they give you the, the name of the studies and, you know, and their slide set. So if you want, you can check that out, too. But this one is more practical. It, it just tells you the recommendations. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll be the editorial on this. I'll, I'll add, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what the, 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 the data that we have in the background. But anyway, so the, the medications that we use for heart failure, just, just make it simple. You know, simplifying this um, is the best way to go. So we use, I call it anti-RAS treatment. So, or, RAS antagonist, which includes um, ACE inhibitors, ARB, and um, aldosterone block blockers. So remember what we talked about last week, the three axes, right? We say the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, we say the sympathetic axis, and then the cardiorenal axis. So clinically, that translates into anti-RAS, i.e. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and aldosterone blockers. Then the second category, beta blockers. The third category, diuretic therapy. Now, there's a category of vasodilator therapy, which used to be the mainstay of treatment, um, say, 30 years ago, um, hydralazine nitrate, um, which there are a few indications that we'll go over. Okay, so without further ado, you know, the first class of medicines, must, much, much talked about ACE inhibitors, these medications, should be in the water, every cardiac patient should take them, and blah, 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 you know all that. So why, why are they important? Well, they restore that um, balance, the neurohormonal balance. On one hand, you have vasoconstrictors. On the other hand, you have vasodilators. And there is homeostasis, compensation state, um, in you and me. Um, I'm assuming no one of you have, have heart failure. But you, and, you, know, you have normal homeostasis, so you have Enough of uh, endothelin and uh, angiotensin II and norepinephrine, and you have enough of bradykinin and, and uh, nitric oxide, so you have good balance. In patients who have heart failure, they have uh, that balance is tipped towards more vasoconstrictors, so you have more endothelin II and blah blah blah. But more more importantly, angiotensin II and ACE inhibitors ad address that by restoring the balance. So you get rid of more angiotensin to, so hemodynamically you have a better milieu now where you have a balance between vasodilators and vasoconstrictors. But also at the 
tissue level, at the molecular cellular level, you, know, you have less angiotensin to exposure and that, hence less adverse um, you know, remodeling. Now, so they are recommended for routine administration to symptomatic and asymptomatic patients with EF below 40%. Um, EF is a, an arbitrary cutoff. Um, you know, we talked about it last time, but view 40% as the cutoff for systolic dysfunction. So anything below 40%, you better give them ACE inhibitors. Um, now, there's one thing that is important in heart failure management, and this is, throughout the lecture, I may say, you know, this is the most important thing to re remember if you don't remember anything about this talk. And this is one, one of them, and you'll probably end up with 10 of them. But, so the one important thing is it's not just putting patients on appropriate neurohormonal medications. But we have to have them um, up titrated to the target doses because all the benefit that you hear about, you know, mortality reduction, uh, re re reducing the readmission rate and all that, the data is on patients who took good doses of medications. And the, and the, we have few slides that go over what doses we're talking about here. So it is important to have them on the medicine and to, and to have them on the right dose of the medicine. Uh, now, if your patient is unable to take ACE inhibitors, um, you can go ahead and use angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, so a patient with angioedema, for example, you may give them angiotensin receptor blocker. However, keep in mind that some patients who have angioedema from ACE inhibitors may get angioedema from ARB, so you're not completely off the hook. Um, but the classic um, alternative to ACE inhibitors in patients with heart failure who, who have low ejection fraction is the combination of hydralazine and nit oral nitrate. Um, and, and, you know, because, you know, you're simply trying to um, you know, reduce the afterload. So this is uh, a good vasodilator. ACE inhibitors Hydralazine and, and hydralazine are more arterial vasodilators than venous vasodilators. But you get the idea. You know, the, you need to um, you need to address the hemodynamic perturbation that you have. Now, this is important. If if your patient, if you give your patient ACE inhibitors and they come back and they have hyperkalemia um, or renal insufficiency. These are not the patients that you will, well, first you'll say that they're intolerant to ACE, uh, ACE inhibitors, or you know, intolerant is better than allergic. You don't want to say allergic, you should say intolerant to ACE inhibitors. So two, two caveats here, okay? And these are my pet peeves. So the, be careful before you label someone with heart failure intolerant to ACE inhibitor, because it's all about the timing of introducing ACE inhibitor therapy. If you're giving ACE inhibitor therapy to a patient that you have overdiuresed, they're hypotensive, they're now dependent on renin because you made them hypotensive, you overdiuresed them, and now you give them ACE inhibitor, of course the creatinine is going to go up. Of course potassium will go up. So you don't want to say they're intolerant to ACE inhibitor because then you deprive them from future rechallenge when their uh, volume status is more um, um, is restored. So be careful with that. Now, if indeed you have someone who's truly intolerant to ACE inhibitor, i.e. you tried it twice, tried low dose, and they're not hypovolemic, then this is not the patient you want to give them ARBs because it's the same mechanism. You know, they didn't tolerate ACE inhibitor because, for some reason, either because they have advanced heart failure or they have very low blood pressure or for whatever reason, you don't want to give them ARB. This is a patient you want to give them um, hydralazine nitroglycerin. So keep that in mind. Now this is a list of the medications, and we have data on most of these medications. And I, I can point out to a couple of nuances here. I can tell you the bottom line: nobody's going to use captopril, you know, three times a day. I mean, no, nobody's nobody's going to use it. But can someone tell me what what would be one use of captopril? Like, what in which patient would you think that captopril would be beneficial? Okay, and why do you say that? Okay, good. So I give you an example. Uh, yes, he said borderline blood pressure, so he would like to give him short-acting, um, short-acting medication. So uh, about a week ago, I had a patient who came in sick, 
the butamine, dopamine, near, not cardiogenic shock, but near cardiogenic shock, and uh, potassium was high. Um, and we were able to wean him off the um, inotropic therapy, but uh, his blood pressure was very marginal. So I, I wanted to start ACE inhibitor on him. So I gave him captopril, and I gave it to him for two days. And, and he didn't like me because it was making him dizzy and you know, all that. But then the, the but then he, but he eventually stayed on it, and I switched him to less than a pril, uh, long acting. So you can use captopril in in the hospital in someone who's sick or borderline blood pressure. Um, now, some of these um, ACE inhibitors have more um, tissue um, a tissue um, effect on the tissue ACE than others, um, but that's not very relevant to the heart failure population in general. So you can use it interchangeably. I can tell you, though, in a heart failure clinic, most of the ACE inhibitors that we use are either enalapril, which you use twice a day, or probably lisinopril, which is because it's one, once daily. Now, another thing which is a practical uh, uh, bit of information that may be helpful to you. There's one ACE inhibitor here, um, or uh, one agent, that may affect the liver and cause a bilirubin to be high. Which one? Anyone knows? More like a Jeopardy question. Nalapril. For some reason, it, it causes a, a, a bilirubin to uh, go up. And, and, that, and that actually poses uh, a problem in advanced heart failure patients who are considered for transplant. They come to you, the, they have abnormal um, LFT, their uh, uh, total ability is elevated, and, and you're trying to decide, is this because of congestive hepatopathy or is it because they have fibrosis? Now you're going to set them up for a transplant. So that, that will be contraindicated if they have se severe liver fibrosis. Or is it simply the enalapril? And we've had several patients that you know, we took off enalapril and the uh, ability came down. So that's something to keep in mind. But these doses you can find, it again, if you Google HFSA guidelines, you can find this, and it has nice. And then you see there, far end, um, the mean doses used in clinical trials. These are some bold doses. You can't just expect um, the outcome that was seen in multiple clinical trials. And you know, ACE inhibitors were studied in at least seven or 8,000 patients in heart failure population. Um, you really need to get the dose up. Now, one last uh, point about this. They did a study that looked at average dose of ACE inhibitor uh, lacinopril versus high dose. So I believe 20 milligram versus 40 milligram. And the only benefit you realize from um, increasing the dose to 40 milligram is, which is a great benefit, which is reducing hospitalization. So there, there is data behind it, albeit just one trial. Now, ARBs recommended for symptomatic, asymptomatic, who in patients who are intolerant to ACE inhibitors and for reasons other than um, hyperkalemia or renal um, Now, again, I mentioned this, angioedema, it, you, can, you can try it, you can try it, but, um, but you have to be careful. Um, and then if patients cannot tolerate ARB, you just go ahead and do hydralazine. Now, we have, and I'm going to avoid um, uh, mentioning the name of the trials um, that, that, that looked at it, so just to make it more general um, review. But there, there is some data that looked at using angiotensin receptor blockers, again, with the idea of targeting angiotensin 2 downstream, all the way downstream, and preventing um, uh, activation of the RAS system that way. So we have some data in post-MI um, heart failure. And that, that data is very good. And so you, you, you actually, you'll be right prescribing ARB from the get-go in patients uh, with heart failure post-MI. And, and the agent is Valsartan, which is diazine. Now, Valsartan is used in hypertension once daily dosing, right? But in heart failure, for some reason, the indication is twice daily. So these are the, these are the doses. Um, I can tell you the, the biggest study that looked at um, ARBs in heart failure looked at candesartan, um, the CARM study. And, you know, but the, the problem with this is your patient formulary or whatever um, insurance plan they have, you, you, have to, you have to be sensitive to that. So you end up doing what is right for the patient. So I, I can say that, and this is off the, you know, this is 
you can take this comment. You know that 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 you can you're right you, you're right go ahead going ahead and, and prescribing NARB and it's an a class effect. However, if you're a hardcore evidence based medicine physician, you, you know you should adhere to whatever the data shows. But you can give them any ARB in my book. Now. Um, Um, no, and no. In fact, in fact, uh, uh, the reason why <laughs> this is a good question, and and in fact, there, are you guys aware of the controversy of um, ARBs in, in coronary artery disease or MI? Has anyone heard of that before? So that that was that was probably about five or six years ago. Um, there was a, a paper in Lancet that that basically linked. ARB, they looked at all the trials, they did meta-analysis, and they showed that patients who took ARBs for hypertension had more coronary artery disease, had more myocardial infarction. And the hypothesis was that if you're blocking all the way downstream, you're blocking angiotensin II, and you're blocking it in people who are having, you know, then you're probably tipping that balance between, um, you know, fibrotic, you know, fibrosis and no fibrosis. And, and you know, coronary artery disease, stable coronary artery disease is when you have fibrotic plaque. But then if you have, um, un if, you, if you affect or influence the fibrotic process, you may destabilize the plaque. Anyway, so a long explanation for that. But, but I would think that ARBs are not good in patients with coronary artery disease. So I cannot explain why in post-MI, except, except that immediate post-MI, you go, remember, Immediate post MI heart failure is different from your patient who's had hypertension for 20 years and then developed heart, heart failure. Because they went from normal heart, from remember that uh, football shaped heart, to the basketball shaped heart, you know, overnight. So they really like the, the anti, um, they, they, they really like the renin. They like that system because, you know, it helps them immediately. So, I think the benefit you see with ARB more than ACE inhibitors in post-MI reflect the fact that they like less RAS inhibition. So ironically, for the reason that ARB is weak, is becoming better in people immediately post-MI. But that's just that's a weird explanation of this. But just keep that in mind. Um, so beta blockers, um, again, you now know how important beta blockers. You have too much uh, norepinephrine uh, uh, spillover. Um, you know, the myocyte is exposed to um, lots of um, bad signals uh, towards uh, fibrosis, uh, apto apoptosis, um, you know, cell necrosis, cell necrosis, and then there's energy, energy um, st uh, starving uh, myocyte. When you give beta blockers, you change all of that. Uh, and I showed you the slides on that. And, and, and these medications, a class of, this, is, this class of medicine is recommended in, um, Symptomatic and asymptomatic. So you, if you if you send someone for an echocardiogram and they uh, for whatever reason and and the echo comes back 39 38 percent EF and they don't have heart failure symptoms. So this is by definition heart failure stage B, right? So stage A is any condition that predisposes you to heart failure. Stage B is structural damage but no clinical heart failure. So they've never had congestion. Stage C is structural damage in addition to congestion or low output. And stage D is living with heart failure on a daily basis. So if you have a, a stage B patient with structural heart disease, you better put them on ACE inhibitor and beta blockers. This is your opportunity to prevent uh, significant remodeling. Um, now, the best time, when is the best time to introduce beta blockers? What is the best the optimal time? timing for introducing beta blockers in heart failure patients. Okay, um, like right when they're exacerbating or when? Yeah. Chronic? Why not? Okay. Well, it, you're right. I mean, so you don't want to give it when they're acutely, you know, crumping. You don't want to do that. But you want to, you want to do it in the hospital. You want to do it when you have them in a controlled environment. You want to do it immediately after. 
think about it. In the hospital, the day, of the, the day before discharge, supposedly is the day, this is the best you can get them, right, in terms of volume status. So this is your opportunity to introduce beta blockers. You don't want to do it when um, they went home to come back and, because then something bad called physician inertia kicks in when they come to see you. You know, you go like, well, I, you know, I, I feel like they're stable. I don't want to give it to them. Or blood pressure is marginal. Or you know, I think they're congested. So you do it in the hospital. But don't do it the first day they come in to, you know, when they're sick. Do it when you're getting ready to discharge them home, so the day before. So keep that in mind. And then when you do it, you just go ahead and give very low dose. Um, so the take-home message is initiate beta blocker when they are dry um, or relatively dry. Because remember, okay, so pharmacological effect, biological effect. When do we care about the pharmacological effect? What kind of patient that we're going after the pharmacological effect that we see on cardiology service? MI, so someone with acute MI, I want to reduce the you know, oxygen demand. Um, um, and, and so I want to slow the heart rate. So that's when I want the pharmacological effect. That's why I started and I may even push the dose. The biological effect is the long term that happens over weeks and months when you're changing the cellular milieu. And, and so there's no rush to start it in the hospital for the purpose of getting immediate benefit. The only reason you start it in the hospital is to get them on it. And so when they get to their primary care doctor or cardiologist, they already been, they, you've done the job for them. Um, now, Contraindications. Now, what, what are the classic contraindications? Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to say, think of every classic contraindication of beta blocker that you were taught in medical school and throw it in the trash can when it comes to heart failure. Well, this is my exaggeration to make a point. But it turns out that there are only few, very few contraindications to the beta blockers in heart failure. Even COPD. We now have some amazing data that patients who have heart failure and concomitant COPD not only not only will benefit will not only will tolerate beta blocker but may actually benefit for some odd reason and it has to do with the with the beta receptor distribution and density in the bronchial tree so for some odd reason beta blockers are good in patients with CHF and COPD um, so patients with asthma, if they are not actively wheezing, it's not a contraindication. And it depends on what beta blocker you give them. I mean, if you're giving your patient, and we have to move quick, but if you give your patient a non-selective beta blocker, of course, you're gonna, I mean, I worry about you know, asthma, but you have to really look at what, what your patient has. So if they have asthma, you go ahead and give selective beta blockers, such as metoprolol, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, so in the you know, old days, we used to say, Diabetics should not get beta blocker. I think this is an outrageous state. Whoever came up with this, it's a myth. I mean, not only you don't worry about it, you should give beta blocker to diabetics. Of course, what is the concern? Why, why would you be concerned to give beta blocker to diabetic? What is the potential concern? Well, that's, that's, all, <laughs> that's all just someone say that that's going to happen and never happened and then it carried on. So don't fear that, okay? Um, so give it. And, okay, so moving on, um, you give them the dose, say, 3.125 uh, carvedilol, and then you, you up-titrate it every two weeks, okay? So you give it up-titrate every two weeks, as simple as that. So you bring them to your office every two weeks until you get to the target dose. Now, this is, this is probably, again, another one that you should, another take-home message, another take-home message. And this, this is confusing. This is confusing to even heart failure specialists. What do we do with the beta blocker when they come in? Okay, what do we do? I mean, like, they're co they come in, they're decompensated, you know, should we continue beta blocker? What do we do? So, how many want to continue? Don't look at the slide. How many want to continue beta blocker? You all looked at the slide, I think. But, okay, how, how many want to discontinue beta blocker? Okay, okay. So, how do you reconcile it? Again, remember, there is pharmacological effect and there is biological effect. So, if your patient comes in and, and you really want, and you're worried about the pharmacological effect of beta blocker, i.e., they come in and they're very bradycardic with their heart failure exacerbation, or they come in and they're very hypotensive and you're worried about cardiogenic shock, 
yeah, you need to do something about it. But if they come in and they're fine with their uh, vital signs, they just have exacerbation of the heart their heart failure, then continue because if you discontinue beta blocker, then you eliminated that biological effect that they have been experiencing for months or even years. Then you took them back to square zero where you have to reintroduce beta blockers. So here's the bottom line. They come in, so let's make it simple. They come in, if, this is your t if they're on your, on your service, so if they are on the internal medicine service, I can hardly think of a reason why you need to discontinue beta blocker. If you're in the MICU service, you probably need to think about it. If you're on the cardiology service and the patient in the, you know, in the intensive care unit, you may need to think about it. So it depends on what, how your patient looks like. But 90% of times, continue it. And if you want to do something about it, you can uh, cut it in half. Okay, but don't stop it. Don't stop beta blocker. Because I know who, the, who, who does it. I'm just kidding. Don't stop it. So this is just a summary, summary of beta blocker uh, therapy and heart failure. So initiate at low dose, very small font, so don't worry about reading it. Okay, so initiate at low doses, okay? Um, don't worry about pushing. Oh, that's another one. I really don't like this. When, when cardiologists push the dose of beta blocker on heart failure patients in the hospital, I don't like it. I, I get n nervous when that happens. Because, again, pharmacological effect, I, don't, I could care less about it now. I mean, I don't, I don't want it. And In fact, it goes back to what, what he said. You know, if, if we do it, we may, we may worsen the condition. I just want to give him just a little bit of it just to get him started. I don't want to push the dose. This is not acute MI. I just want to put him on 3.125 and fine. Now, you, you're going to be faced by, by attendings or cardiologists who will tell you, go up on the dose. Tell him no. I'm not going to do it. That's it. And <laughs> now, you up titrate it every, every two weeks. Now, what do you do? Okay, so let's say you put someone on 3.25. They went home, they came to you for follow-up in two weeks. And then you are bold and you went up to 6.25 twice a day. And then your nurse calls you, she calls you and she says, you know, Mr. Jones is calling saying that he's short of his breath and has have some swelling in his legs. What do you do on the phone? But he's fine otherwise when he's, he's okay. Hmm? So you increase the leak. Again, don't touch the beta blocker. Now, if he comes back and he's, you know, passing out and his heart rate is 40, you know, that's a different thing. But, you know, CHF exacerbation, up the Lasix, okay? So these are the different beta blockers. Um, carvedilol, uh, we have long-acting carvedilol, we have metoprolol. Now, do you guys have any preference using carvedilol? Who, who, who likes carvedilol more than metoprolol for whatever reason? How about metoprolol? So it seems like nobody likes anything. Well, yeah, this is important, so which one to use? I, I tell you, you can use either one of them. And there are a lot of literature on which one to use. Here's my advice to you. Just pick one that you get used to prescribing and know how to titrate, not just for heart failure, but in cardiology in general, and use it. There are some nuances. So carvedilol is selective or non-selective. Non-selective, so don't use it in asthmatic patients. Carvedilol, what does it have in addition to beta blocker properties? Alpha blockers, so if someone has marginal blood pressure, you don't, you don't want to use it. Um, which one potentially um, has more metabolic derangement? Metoprolol or, or carvedilol? Metoprolol, so if you have someone with metabolic syndrome, you might, might want to use it. So, so do it that way. Okay, skip through this. About 15 minutes. So, all right. Aldosterone antagonist. What is the name of that landmark trial? The big trial. Which what, what what is it called? The Rouse trial. Okay, so that was in 1999, and they took patients who are sick with heart failure, NYHA class three to four, and um, that time only 10 percent of patients were on beta blockers. So mo most of them were on digoxin, uh, diuretics, and, and ACE inhibitors, and they gave them uh, aldosterone blockers, um, Dactone, and there were at least 30% reduction in mortality. So this is a very good medicine. Now, take home message, so 
go to the take home message. Who do you give um, spironolactone to? Well, there will be an upgrade to the guidelines coming where you can give it to pretty much anyone with heart failure. But for now, for now, I want you to remember to give it to patients who at least have NYHA class 3 or 4, i.e. they're symptomatic. But they better have a creatinine that is less than 2.5 or GFR greater than 30 and potassium less than 5. And if you, if you give them um, spironolactone, you should check their electrolytes very frequently. Otherwise, it'll, something will happen like it happened in Canada. Okay? And do you know what happened in Canada? So they rolled out this spironolactone, and everybody used it. And within two years, that report that looked at dialysis rate from hyperkalemia, and it went through the roof. And everybody is on dialysis now from hyperkalemia. So if you're in nephrology, you, you know, you want to do it, that's fine, but, but don't. I mean, it's, it's going to cause hyperkalemia. So. And, you know, some people don't like aldosterone antagonists. And they say, I'm not going to use it because it causes hyperkalemia. And I just don't like it. And I say, well, we don't, well, I, this analogy doesn't work anymore. I used to say that before Pradexa was available. And I used to say, well, warfarin. If you don't know how to use it, don't use it. I don't want you to use it if you don't know how to use it and check the labs. The same for aldactone, you know, spironolactone. If you don't know how to use it, which, which means that you have to check uh, potassium and make sure they're not taking ibuprofen, uh, NSAIDs, and, you know, what have you. So, but if you know how to use it, go ahead and use it. Now, um, if you have one, if you have a patient who is recovering from myocardial infarction, and um, they don't have symptoms of heart failure, but their ejection fraction is, say, 35%. So this is LV systolic dysfunction, say, asymptomatic, that is ischemic, post-MI. There is an indication for eplerinone. So remember that, eplerinone. Um, that's a big study that looked at, at using eplerinone. So eplerinone, what is the advantage of eplerinone over spironolactone in terms of side effects? It is cleaner in what way? One big, one big problem with, what is one big problem in, with spironolactone in men? Okay, gynecomastia. So epilurinone will, will save, your, save your patient from that problem. So, um, <laughs> so keep that in mind. All right, so hydralazine and, and nitrate, one of the oldest uh, treatment that we, tr treatment that we, treatments that we have in heart failure. And it works simply because it's a vasodilator. So you open up the, um, you, you reduce vascular resistance, you improve cardiac output. Simple as that. Um, now, it also works beyond just the, the, the macroeconomics of heart failure, if you will. So beyond the hemodynamic model, it works at the cellular level, especially in African American patients, because it restores the endothelial dysfunction. African-American patients, the pathophysiology of their uh, heart failure seems to be mostly related to uh, nitric oxide deficiency and, and, and what have you. So hydralazine nit nitrate not only um, um, restores the hemodynamic um, disturbances, but it may actually improve endothelial function. So you can use it as an alternative to ACE inhibitors or ARBs, or you can actually use it as an add-on to your treatment. This is the probably only study that was done um, of, of its kind and the only study that will ever be done because I've never seen any study that stirred um, such controversy like the AHEF trial. Do you guys remember that trial? You, you were probably in high school. Right? Yeah. So the AHEF trial took only African-American patients. So only African-American patients with heart failure. So. Um, they, you know, so it's, it's really more like a, a personal, personalized medicine approach. And they demonstrated 40% mortality reduction super, on top of what you get from ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. So this is a landmark trial, and, and it's a good trial. And so who do you give hydralazine nitrate as an add-on? So remember, I'm not saying you know, as an alternative now. This is an add-on. So this is under polypharmacy category, so multiple drug therapy. So you give it to African-American patient who has systolic heart failure, an 
YHA class 3 and ejection fraction below 35%, you must give them hydralazine nitrogen, provided blood pressure permits. Um, keep that in mind. Any questions so far? We only have 10, 10 minutes. So these are the doses. Now, um, the, the trade um, name of uh, hydralazine nitrate combination is Bidol. That company went through lots of you know trouble. You know, actually it bankrupted at one point, and I think it was bought by another company now because nobody would use that medicine. I don't know for some reason people thought you can just give hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. I don't know why. Maybe because Bidol was like a hundred and fifty dollars, and <laughs> that was like two dollars. So pe people didn't use Bidol, and that's why the company almost bankrupted. Um, but the FDA did something that I, that nev they never done. They came out with a statement saying that you should not use alternative to Bidol, i.e. the generic. You should stick to the, you know, Bidol. I don't know how many of the panel members had conflict of interest and stuff, but they say they don't. But you know, but they came out with these ele elegant pharma pharmacokinetic studies and all that, saying that you know, I don't buy all that. So if you want to give hydralazine a nitrate. Give it, but look, notice you, got, you have to give it four times a day. Your patient may not come back to see you, which may be a good thing, you know. But, but I mean, good thing for the patient. I'm just kidding. So, you know, you if you want to give it, give it QID. You have to give it four times a day. Hydralazine nitrate. Well, but the, the reality is, you know, just give it three times a day. We'll be fine. Yeah, three times. So it's not like a whole lot of improvement. You're right. Absolutely right. Well, I tell you, it is a whole lot of improvement. You know why? Because the Bidol comes the, the you know, because instead of taking like 15 pills, you know, you take maybe like seven or whatever. So. And we'll skip that. <laughs> we give a lot of medicines to these patients. I, I saw one patient, I know I'm digressing, but I saw one patient yesterday tell you, I saw him in the hospital. And, you know, we gave him Dijoxin, Lasix, he's on Warfarin, for some reason he's on Aspirin. ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, um, and uh, what else? And then, of course, he has to be on uh, Prilosec. I don't know why either, but he's on Prilosec. I mean, anyway, he's on like 10 medicines. And I was so proud of myself. You know, we got him on the right dose. And we sent him home. We were very excited. <laughs> he came yesterday for his one-week follow-up. He's only taken two medicines. And, you know, he's taken Dijoxin and Lasix. So pretty much 19, 10 kind of medicine. And, he, and he, you know what he told me? And, and I was embarrassed. He told me, I just feel good with these medicines. And the other medicines make me feel bad. So I'm not taking the medicine that make me feel bad. So of course, I said, no, you have to take your medicine. I mean, I didn't say it that way. I, I was just more you know, passionate about it. But, but he has a point. You know, we sent him home on 10 different medicines. So there is a problem with multi-drug therapy and polypharmacy. So you, you better you know, not, you, you really, I tell you how you can solve this problem. That's another take-home message. And I swear to you, if you go sit next to the patient, not stand, are you guys aware of this? This is another digression. Do, do you know that study? They, they did, um, so they did randomized trial where they went to, I think, hospital in, in, um, I think in New England. And, and basically, they had you know, like 10 doctors walk in the room, just walk in the room and talk to the patient and you know, deliver news or whatever, standing, just standing and spending maybe like 15 minutes or 10 minutes standing, 15 minutes. And then they, had, they turn around, they bring another patient, another doctor who went in there and sat down, just sat down and, and spent maybe two minutes. And every single patient thought that they liked the, patient, the doctor who sat down, and although spent only two minutes. So what, what I'm trying to say, you walk in the room, sit down, just sit down <laughs> for two minutes and, and just tell them, why you take every medicine? Believe me, they understand it, especially when they're sick in the hospital. They're, they're all ears. I mean, they're going to listen to you. Sit down and say, I'm giving you the Coreg because right now your car engine, it, it, your, heart, you know, your heart is an engine running two cylinders. Okay? It should run six cylinders. And of course, the mechanics of your patients will perk up. Like, oh, wow, I like that. And tell them, and then, of course, and then they're going to, you know, some people will cry, will start crying, you know, or tearing up when you say that, because, you know, from six cylinders to two cylinders, not good. And, 
but then, but then it's remarkable. It's, it's a remarkable moment when, when then you say, well, but I have good news for you. If I give you Coreg, then in two, in two months, three months, you may actually gain two cylinders or three cylinders. And you see that, you know, they're, they, like, they love it. And, and believe me, they're going to be on the medicine when they come back to see you. So my point is, we give them lot, lots of medicine and, and, and we have to say, I did sit down with this patient. I don't know what happened. He didn't take it, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, I practiced what I just told you, but it, sometimes it doesn't work. He goes to the VA clinic. I think it's something about the VA clinic. All right, so we're almost done. Um, so we did ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, ARBs, um, hydralazine nitroglycerin, and then uh, aldosterone. So we have maybe three or four minutes diuretics. Let me, I'm not going to go through the slides. Let's just talk about diuretics. Um, all right, so who, and, and I made that example a couple of years ago. I gave the same lecture. Who remembers how we used to treat rheumatoid arthritis? in 1996, when I finished medical school. What was the main treatment for rheumatoid arthritis? What? Steroids, OK. The only treatment, steroids, OK. What is the mainstay treatment? What is the, the, the street treatment right now? What is it? OK, so biologics, right? You know, you give disease-modifying drugs. So what does this have to do with heart failure? Well, it's the same story. You know. In heart failure, you have crutches, I call them crutches, um, di diuretics, and then you have disease-modifying medications. So the disease-modifying medications, meaning ACE inhibitors and ARBs and, and beta blockers. So you always have to be suspicious of your patient taking diuretic treatments. The reality is, I used to say, the first time I gave this lecture, uh, 10 years ago, I used to say, everyone should come off diuretics and not not take it, you know, and, and, and then get to the point where, you know, you got them so good to the point they don't need it. I, realistically, that's not going to happen. Patients will need diuretics. Probably 60% or 70% of your patients with heart failure will be on diuretics. But, but I, what I want you to do is view, you know how the checklist, the old intern checklist of why my patient has Foley today, why, you know, whatever. You should add that to your, you know, checklist. You know, what, what, can I lower the dose of diuretics? Can I... Um, do th that. And why, why is that? If, remember the, the pathophysiology? Why, why uh, diuretics can be detrimental in heart failure? What can they do? Simple. What system can they activate? So the, the RAS system, right? So because you're volume depleting your patients. And it will become vicious cycle. You're depleting them. They have RAS activation then you're depleting them more, then they have more RAS activation, then guess what you do? You grab that big gun, which is metolazone, right, xeroxalin, and you blast them, like you blast that. I saw one patient yesterday with someone, um, and that someone had been treating this patient with 200 milligram Demodex, because you had to, you, they had to do, it, to do it that way, because patient's symptomatic. 200 milligram torsamide. 200 milligram torsamide is what? How much Lasix is that? All right, so let's talk about this. So torsamide, so torsamide, bumetanide, and uh, furosamide. Furosamide is Lasix, bumetanide, bumex. Torsamide is demodex. So 10 torsamide, uh, 20 torsamide uh, or demodex is one bumex is 40 Lasix. So 200 milligram of, um, it's like 400 Lasix, lots, lots of Lasix. Potassium is low, renin is high. You know, you really need to go down on the uh, diuretic regimen and go up on the ACE inhibitor. Always keep that in mind. So, any questions about diuretics? Any question about diuretics? You know, like um, something that you can't, you know, you don't know how to use it or problems using it. Or All right, so if your patient comes in, this is more practical. Patient comes in through the emergency room, and they have heart failure. And this is my last comment. And they have heart failure, um, uh, exacerbation. And um, they're taking 40 milligram um, at home. You know, how much do you want to give them in the emergency room? Of course, they've already given them whatever they've given them. They've already, who's here from the emergency room? OK, why, why is it? 
that everyone gets, you know, steroids and oxygen and um, beta agonist inhaler and Lasix. I don't know what's going on with them when I go there anyway. So, but what, what, how much do you give them if they're taking 40 oral Lasix? How much do you want to give them if you're the first responder? Huh? What was that? <laughs> okay. Oh, what? That's a very smart answer. But how much is enough to make them pee? Like, actually, that's a very good response. But what is? We have to be. I mean, we have to give them something. You know, there's a rule. I mean, there's a rule. Okay, so you double the dose. You double the dose. Okay, I like that. So you double the dose. So you just double the dose. They take in 40 PO, you double the dose. And you give them 80, 80 milligram IV. Okay, now next, what do you do? You do what she said. You know, you, you wait for an hour and see how much you're an output they, they had. So if they had 10 cc, you're an output. This is a patient you need to put them on basic fluid. If they had, and we'll, t we'll have a session on acute heart failure. So that's why I'm not talking too much about it. But, but if, you, if you, so you give them double the dose, and you wait an hour, and, okay, so now one patient, this is the last comment. So one patient that your patient is finished, you know, you're, you're diuresing, you're finished diuresing your patient. You're done with, with the patient, and you want to send him home. Can someone tell me, what, okay, so the, you've, you've been giving 40 milligram IV Lasix twice a day in the hospital. What is the next step before you send him home? PO, okay, for how long? At least a day. Now, some people say maybe uh, morning, afternoon, but I say keep them one more day. What is, what is the average length of stay of heart failure patient in the United States? Four days. Okay, four or five days. What is the average length of stay, stay in Romania? I don't know why I picked Romania, but it was in that study, you know, like in Europe. What is the average length of stay in, in Germany? Huh? Ten days? Like 20 days, talking about 18, 20 days. Now, so the readmission rate is much lower. Well, because the patients are still in the hospital, they can't come back. <laughs> so that's a dumb study. You know, it's a really dumb study. When I read that, I'm like, this is dumb. You know, even I can say, of course your readmission rate is going to be less because the patient is still here, you know. <laughs> anyway, but because they're saying average, but anyway. So, but the point is, um, you need to keep them as long as they need to stay. So 24 hours, oral, Lasix, and the same rule you used in the emergency room, you have to use when you send them home. So they, you, they've been on 40 IV, BID. Please don't send them home on less than what you give them in the hospital. Because they're going to go home, they're going to eat right there. Here you give them, you know, hopefully the, the low salt diet. But, so you send them home on double the oral dose. And whatever the dose that you come up with when you send them home, it better be more than the dose they came in with. Okay, so these are two rules. 24 hours, double the dose that they've been taken inside the, in the hospital. And then if you come with conflict of how much you should send them home, it should be higher than what they came in with. Okay? And we'll have, we'll have a session on acute heart failure. All right, so that, that's it. And